Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, what I'm going to do is run through a couple of slides and um, just introducing you to the SUT, and then I will pass my pass on to Earl Toops, who's here to do uh, a webinar from DCN Diving, um, which should be very interesting. So firstly, just the SUT, Society of Underwater Technology. Um, the purpose of the SUT is to try bring together organizations and individuals with a key interest in underwater technology, ocean science and offshore engineering. Um, affiliated with the SUT, we have the SUT Plus. Um, it's a subset of the SUT for um, young professionals, for developing professionals, graduates, students and other developer professionals in the subsea industry. So for effectively young engineers or new engineers to the industry. Our aim is to effectively uh, introduce um, everyone to you know, new products, to subsea technology, to the environment, um, et cetera, um, with a key focus on underwater technology. So what we hope to do is um, for you to join our, our, our pages, our, our social media pages, and um, effectively, um, you know, get together with us and um, join us for webinars and events, etc. And you can catch us on LinkedIn, YouTube, and um, this webinar will be recorded. And um, you can get in touch with us with our email address. And also you can see um, uh, our web page as well, the SUT web page. So um, if you're interested in any of the events or, or actually presenting, please get in touch and we'll see if we can uh, accommodate you. Um, as I said, this uh, the whole purpose of this is for um, um, to bring you know um, underwater technology to, to, to all of you and any new technologies, etc. Um, we are keen to present and actually learn more about ourselves. So without further ado, I will pass on to Earl uh, from VCN. Thank you very much, Corey. Execution of Subsea Hyperbaric Jacket Repairs by Earl Toops. Currently, I fulfill the role as Hyperbaric Welding and NDT Manager for DCN Diving, and I am the creator and chief architect of the Microhabitat Welding System. This presentation describes the complete journey of the Microhabitat from conception to implementation. After a brief introduction, I will explain the various novel development processes employed followed by a high level system overview and comparison. The welding qualification methodology for the microhabitat will be explained. Details of the offshore repair campaign executed using the microhabitat will be presented before concluding with the system risks, schedule, cost, and future microhabitat development and applications. Ever maturing North Sea jackets coupled with a combination of high fatigue stresses, fabrication defects, high utilization, and a low redundancy design eventually results in fatigue cracking. High sea states often experienced offshore can further exacerbate the problem and if not closely monitored, fatigue cracks can propagate through thickness and around the circumference of the brace relatively quickly, ultimately leading to brace severance. When confronted with a loss of structural integrity, operators historically were faced with two options, expensive subsea repairs or decommissioning the asset. In order to identify possible market opportunities, DC and Divin undertook a research initiative aimed at discovering gaps in the current offering of subsea weld repair technologies. The first step was to identify all currently available welded repair techniques. The next step was to objectively grade each concept against the other. To do this, a scoring matrix was developed. Each technology was scored against a set of predefined criteria covering safety, technical and commercial aspects. Coffer dams. Essentially, a coffer dam is a watertight structure which surrounds the repair location and is open to the atmosphere. The coffer dam structure can be open topped or have a closed top with an access shaft to the surface. Whether the coffer dam is open topped or has an access shaft, a dry environment is provided such that a dry welding repair technique can be performed at one atmosphere. These units can be particularly useful for shallow depth repairs in the splash zone, for example. Conventional habitats. The repair site is enclosed within the habitat, which is sealed around the structure to be repaired, then dewatered by filling the habitat with gas at the same pressure at depth. 
The diver welder, complete with welding equipment, is able to perform the weld in the dry as they would on the surface. The main drawbacks of the system are as follows. Lengthy time to design, fabricate and commission. Significant upfront costs. Often bespoke designed for specific weld location or node geometry. Complex and time consuming installation. Restricted access due to size and ultimately expensive. Wet welding has been utilized for decades across a number of industries and is covered by AWS D3.6M underwater welding code. Most commonly used in shielded metal arc welding or SMAW for short for all passes. On the outset, wet welding poses a very attractive option for well repairs owing to its low execution costs and ability to access difficult to reach locations. However, the likelihood of producing a class A weld according to AWS D3.6M is problematic for the following reasons. The rapid cooling experience due to the liquid environment. Increased concentration of hydrogen in both the weld metal and HAZ. Decreased resistance to hydrogen induced coal cracking or HIC. Water depth limitations and carbon content restrictions. The dry spot welding technique has been employed on offshore structural repairs with varying degrees of success. The habitat fully encloses and isolates the area to be welded from the surrounding environment. The habitat is secured to the structure and purged of water. Heating elements inside the habitat are then used to preheat the parent metal to the level required by the welding procedure. Heated inert gas is then delivered to the habitat, providing a controllable environment around the weld area. The diver welder welds from the outside of the habitat by inserting the welding electrode through a series of small openings in the habitat. A positive pressure differential is maintained inside the habitat, preventing water ingress. Design thinking has been around for many years, but was not widely used outside of the design community until about 10 years ago. The process can be extremely effective in developing new products, services, or formulating innovative solutions for a wide range of problems. Design thinking sets out to simplify the design process by breaking it down into simple steps. Firstly, empathy. Understand the problem from every point of view. Secondly, exploration. Explore every possible solution, even the radical. Thirdly, iteration. Engage in rapid iterative prototyping. Lastly, validation. Function testing in real world application, i.e. using mockups. This process is not without its criticism. Oversimplification of the design process and diminishing technical importance are often cited. However, a modified version of design thinking in conjunction with first principles, minimum viable product or MVP and agile were extremely effective process facilitators for the development of the microhabitat from concept to final delivery and ultimately offshore execution. Applying first principle thinking, focusing on function and not form allowed us to break free from current narrow constructs in order to find a new and innovative solution. When tackling complex problems and trying to come up with cutting edge ideas or radical new innovations, it is often very effective to break down the problem or solution into their fundamental parts that we know to be true using first principles. A dry environment, preheat, in process cleaning, grinding, and adequate vision are required to be able to produce high quality subsea weld repairs. Taking these four fundamental factors into account, it became clear that a smaller, more versatile habitat could be used instead of the larger conventional habitats previously used. The microhabitat concept originated because of a distinct technology gap in the current subsea repair methodologies. Previously, subsea structural repairs have typically relied on purpose-built bespoke welding habitats, which require long lead times and significant upfront cost. More recent techniques use modular habitat systems, which are more flexible in that a single habitat can fit multiple well locations rather than a single location. Although an important improvement on earlier designs, 
the modular habitat system is not without its drawbacks. A significant amount of topside support is required and long installation times ultimately lead to costly high risk repairs. Realizing the market gap, DC and Divin explored alternate repair strategies leading to the development of the DCN microhabitat welding system. With the advent of the microhabitat, it is possible to respond quicker, execute subsea repairs faster, and guarantee quality at a fraction of the cost compared to bespoke or modular habitats. Using a product development framework, similar to Agile, for developing, delivering, sustaining complex products, commonly used in the development of software, drastically reduce the preparation time, making the system very responsive yet flexible. Similar to design thinking, process improvement methods break product development into small increments that decrease the time required for planning and design. Short, iterative and incremental development cycles stimulate the creative product evolution. Additionally, employing a small, dedicated, cross-functional team in combination with standardized products further reduce the response time needed to execute subsea repairs. A total of four habitats were produced in the first six months of production, with each habitat gaining in sophistication and addressing a specific requirement, yet the design, fabrication and testing took less time than the previous version, thus demonstrating the value and need for a product development process improvement framework to be in place. The main habitat housing constructed of steel, a perspex viewing window, watertight gas tight gloves, service umbilical and umbilical penetrator, system exhaust for welding fume and smoke, equipment lock for dry transfer of materials and consumables, internal and external lights, internal and external cameras, electrode holder or welding torch, and various internal hand tools and power tooling. The microhabitat design will depend on the specific location and geometry of the defect to be repaired. Having to produce location-specific microhabitats may seem like a major drawback, but it's not, as the main housing is the only component of the system that changes. The main housing in itself is relatively simple to design and fabricate. The remaining system components are all completely interchangeable between the various microhabitat housings. The microhabitat system key capabilities are as follows. The habitat design and selection of hardware tooling minimizes non-productive time during offshore operations. The habitat can perform a full through thickness repair at any radial position on either vertical or horizontal or diagonal members. The habitat can achieve and maintain a positive pressure differential without flooding. The habitat provides the diver with a clear, unobscured view of the repair site. The habitat permits the use of preheat. The habitat permits the use of portable arc monitoring system or PAMS. Electrical grinders and power wire brushes are standard. NDT of the repair weld can be performed in the habitat in the dry. Multiple welding processes are possible, like flux core arc welding or gas metal arc welding, in addition to the standard SMAW or shielded metal arc welding. The gas electrical air supply can be fed from the DSV or from the top side. After an extended period of welding, the perspex window can become damaged, impairing the welder's vision. Using a flexible canopy called an awning, the window can be replaced in the dry without flooding the habitat or cooling the weld. 
A window can be changed sub C in less than two hours. The awning is extended out in front of the microhabitat and dewatered by filling with heliox. Once dry, the old window can be removed and replaced with the new window before releasing the gas and flooding the awning. The gloves can be damaged by sparks over time and may need to be changed partway through completion of a weld. This too can be performed without flooding the habitat or cooling the weld. A blanked off glove ring or bung is used to plug the glove hole from the inside so the damaged glove can be removed and replaced from the outside. Once the new glove is installed, the bung is removed and the welding operations can continue. A glove can be replaced in a matter of minutes sub C. Of course, the microhabitat has its limitations. These come in the form of brace severances. The central underlying premise to an integrity strategy should be a conscious effort to minimize the risk of brace severance. A robust program of subsea inspection and monitoring, complemented by an effective repair readiness strategy, harnessing the flexibility of the microhabitat, offers operators the best chance of avoiding a severance scenario. The projection for many North Sea platforms is to sustain production for a further 20 plus years. The ability to reliably detect and repair defects is fundamental to meeting these life of field targets, particularly in the context of mature fields. As production curves decline and the production infrastructure ages, these fields become technically, operationally and economically challenging. Contrary to the notion that the life of the producing asset ends when production runs out, the reality is the life of the asset ends when profits run out. This situation presents a conundrum for many operators. The microhabitat can help shift the economics in mature fields by offering operators a cost-effective means to meeting this challenge. The dramatic savings offered in comparison to traditional repairs can go a long way in maintaining the economic viability of mature assets. The microhabitat creates a step change in the way repair projects are conducted and facilitates the ongoing effort to drive down asset integrity costs. The welding qualification process followed for the microhabitat is displayed on this slide. However, the microhabitat is an emerging technology and as a result, not specifically addressed in current codes or standards. This presents issues adhering to current code requirements during the welding procedure and welder qualifications. The welding qualifications and testing were witnessed and all documentation was reviewed and approved by an internationally recognized independent verification body or IVB. This is the DCN Hyperbaric Test Center located in bergen op -Zoom, where the qualifications were performed. DCN are the only company in the world to have their own in-house hyperbaric testing facility. The qualification program consisted of gas tungsten arc welding plus shielded metal arc welding procedures and also included a full cool down and reheat during the qualification. The purpose of this was to mimic the event where the DSV must pull off the platform and the DSV supplies cannot be utilized for that reason. Multiple heat cycles quenching to simulate unintentional flooding and optimum and reduced preheat temperature qualifications, i.e. at 50 degrees and 100 degrees C respectively. The well quality produced in the microhabitat is comparable to a well produced on the surface in workshop type conditions. The quality was verified and proven by NDT or non-destructive testing carried out by an independent third party NDT company and included manual ultrasonic testing time of flight diffraction, and radiographic testing. Similarly, the mechanical properties of a well produced in the microhabitat are comparable to the mechanical properties of a well produced on the surface in workshop type conditions. This too has been verified and proven by performing mechanical testing in accordance with AWS D3.6M 2017. The world's first microhabitat weld repair was successfully executed by DCN diving in July 2020. The defect was a through thickness crack with a total length of 567 millimeters situated on a horizontal jacket member at minus 46 meters water depth. The closure weld in which the defect was found had been repaired several times previously and therefore had existing backing bars in place, adding additional complexity to the repair. 
During the same campaign, a second well repair to a vertical diagonal member was performed using a different specifically designed microhabitat. The water depth for this repair site was minus 74 meters. This particular location required the repair of three discrete defects all in the vicinity of the closure weld. The first repair to a relief slot in a 60 millimeter node. Secondly, a repair to the closure weld defect where the diagonal brace joins the node transitioning from 60 millimeters to 30 millimeters wall thickness. And lastly, the repair to an access window weld situated just below the closure weld at the six o'clock position. The attractiveness of hydrocarbon arc gouging is best illustrated by the following case study. The offshore jacket repair campaign carried out last summer involved the excavation of four each weld defects to enable the hyperbaric weld repairs. While completely removing the weld defects, the excavations had to produce a suitable groove profile for welding, similar to the detail shown here. Moreover, all four well locations had differing positions, geometries, diameters, or wall thicknesses. Primarily, a mechanical milling machine concept was explored to remove the defects while machining the well groove. However, the use of the milling machine was determined to be problematic for the following reasons. Four separate bespoke milling machines would have been required, one machine for each location. A 16 week lead time for detailed design and fabrication of the unit. Only symmetrical well groove profiles are possible with a milling machine. In other words, asymmetric or compound well groove profiles are not possible using this tool. And the cost for one unit was circa half a million pounds. Faced with this prospect, I explored alternate methods for excavation of the well defects and came up with a notion of using hydrocarbon arc gouging. I was extremely familiar with air carbon arc gouging as it was commonly used for making pipeline well repairs on board the lay barges. Once we devised a makeshift gouging torch, we trialed and tested the process in our test tank under simulated conditions we expected to see on site offshore. Here is some of the actual diver hat camera footage of hydrocarbon arc gouging of a weld on a jacket at 74 meter seawater. There were no issues to report and the process worked flawlessly. The diver welder was able to see the defect and follow it in the weld easily. The table shown here compares the various underwater excavation methodologies with regards to the required preparation and setup time. From a preparation and setup time perspective, it is easy to see that wet gouging is by far the most straightforward and simple compared to other underwater methods.
It should be stressed that modular habitat systems have and will continue to be operated safely from offshore installations where there are no other viable means of repair. The primary aim of the offshore installation safety case regulations is to reduce the risk for major accident hazards to workforce personnel. In line with the Health and Safety Workers Act, this constitutes a continual demonstration that major accident hazard risks have been reduced to a level which is as low as reasonably practicable. In other words, the operator should only consider a modular habitat if the microhabitat is not viable as in the case of a severed brace, for example. The microhabitat concept significantly reduces risk to divers and in certain instances eliminates some of the hazards associated with the use of a modular habitat. Remarkably, this technology innovation not only reduces risk but also reduces business costs. This contrasts with the traditional model whereby the cost associated with risk reduction efforts are often grossly disproportionate to the risk reduction achieved. The differentiating factor between the modular habitat and the microhabitat is that the former requires the diver to be undressed from their diving suits, making them more vulnerable in the event of an emergency. In a scenario where the diver is unable to be recovered to the DSV, they must enter a temporary refuge in the habitat. With the microhabitat, the diver is always in his natural environment. Emergent scenarios are therefore no different from any other diving operation whereby the diver makes his way back to the bell and can be recovered to the DSV. The development of the microhabitat marks a significant leap forward in diver safety. Some of the main advantages are no requirement for life support package or LSP, no requirement for diver safety module or DSM, removal of confined sp space working, removal of explosive environment. With the advent of the microhabitat, it is possible to respond quicker, execute subsea repairs faster, and guarantee quality at a fraction of the cost compared to bespoke or modular habitats. For example, it was possible to complete four hyperbaric wells repairs using two different microhabitats in under six weeks. By reducing the size, it is possible to reduce fabrication, production, and handling costs of the microhabitat. Furthermore, the smaller footprint reduces insulation time while simplifying the sealing and dewatering offshore, saving both time and money. The phase gate approach minimizes risks and allows the project team to adapt to new requirements and learnings. Phase one takes no more than two weeks where we define the project requirements and conditions. Phase two typically takes about six weeks where we perform the detailed design, fabrication and testing of the microhabitat. Phase three mainly consists of hyperbaric welding procedure qualification testing and project procedure development. Phase four is where welder qualification testing is conducted and project procedures are completed and approved. Phase five is mobilization and offshore execution of the repair. The microhabitat system is extremely flexible and can be designed and adapted for use in virtually any location or geometry. Currently, there is an inquiry from a North Sea major operator looking to use the microhabitat technology for the repair of conductor guides. Another major North Sea operator have been unable to find a viable repair solution for a fatigue crack located in a K node at the 12 o'clock position. DCN were able to develop a three-day concept of a microhabitat which could be used to execute the repairs at this location. Several global operators have expressed interest in the microhabitat for localized subsea welded repairs on pipelines. Shown here is a 3D concept for welding of a split sleeve using a microhabitat. The microhabitat can be employed on tubular, curved or flat structures, as in the case of storage tanks depicted here. The microhabitat can provide operators with a viable repair solution for subsea structures, which were previously thought to be unrepairable. Operators can now satisfy the HSE safety case with regards to structural integrity. The microhabitat can be used to weld on brackets in order to be able to bolt on supports or to strengthen existing structures. While the development of the microhabitat was intended initially for subsea jacket repairs, this technology can be applied to any subsea structure, making the prospect even more inviting to end users and customers alike. Moreover, the microhabitat can be used to execute corrosion or coating repairs. DCN and I hope 
you found the presentation informative and thank you for your time. Should there be any questions, we would be glad to try to provide you with the answers. So yeah, that concludes the, the presentation from my end, Corey. Well, thank you very much, Earl. That's um, very informative, very worthwhile.